Um, so tonight I'm going to try to give you a little understanding of the history of ladies' underwear. Not gentlemen's underwear, but ladies' underwear. So <laughs> the men in the audience might find it interesting too. I'll just show you the slides. This is a pretty fancy, risque outfit uh, from about 1990 from Agen provocateur, a French lingerie company. And um, this particular outfit is in the collection of the Victorian Apple Museum in London. So, you can look at that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Underwear has long... Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Underwear has long been a badge of respectability and a moral fraud. Even when it is kept hidden, it covers, protects, warms, and cools. It supports, firms, and shapes, and is part of our hygiene. The birth of modesty no doubt contributed to the invention of underclothing, as did the love of seduction, both hiding and revealing what one wanted to show. It is our second skin and plays a secret role in our lives, but also a very public one. It is really not a paradox that this most intimate class of clothing should in its public manifestation be primarily sexual. It's intimate next to the skin location is the basic stimulus extended by the act of imagination or a quirk of custom. Women's breasts have lived through many incarnations, compressed, uplifted, or left au natural. After centuries of... <coughs> After centuries of corsets that sheathed our bodies in armor, all to make them more desirable. Women finally jettisoned this instrument of torture at the beginning of the 20th century and replaced it with something that was just as complicated but much less restricted, the brassiere. <laughs> Since the mid 20th century, there has been a revolution in the underwear department. We have thrown modesty to the wind, and underwear becomes more and more dispensable. We are often wearing as outer clothing that which we have discarded as underclothing. Camisoles, petticoats, and knickers have become fads and staples of fashion. Fashion itself has become lighter and briefer, designed to emphasize figures that have become defined by healthy eating and exercise, rather than by the restricting corsets and girdles. This evening I want to share with you a brief history of this intimate, mysterious pieces of clothing that have always been part of the feminine allure. The civilizations of the ancient world, Crete, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, each dealt with breasts in their own way, either making them more prominent and exposing them, or trying to deny them. Cretan women wore corsets that supported their breasts at the base and thrust them forward, spectacular and naked. Crete dominated the Mediterranean world in 2000 to 1500 BC in all things fashionable, just as Paris would many centuries later. The high-born women of Egypt also went bare-breasted, wearing a transparent gown that tied beneath the breasts, as you can see on the right-hand side. This is a beautiful depiction of a Greek woman in The Rape of the Sabine Women by Jacques-Louis David in 1799, which hangs in the Louvre in Paris. With the rise of the Greek civilization, women wore a strip of rolled cloth, often red in color, tied beneath their breasts. By the classical period of the 5th century BC, linen tunics called chitons and the shorter peplos were worn by both men and women. 
This is a detail of the birth of Venus from the Ludovici throne, circa 740 to 760 BC, of two attendants drawing her peplos over her filmy shift. The mosaic in the Villa Romana in Sicily shows female gymnasts in the 4th century AD wearing shaped loin cloths and a strophium, a red scarf and folding the breasts to give them support and looking astonishingly like a modern bikini. <laughs> With the fall of the Roman Empire in 746 AD, breast binding fell out of fashion and the purpose of clothing was to hide the human form. There were strict rules of dress imposed upon Roman wives, much as there are today in Islamic cultures. This is a medieval woman by Roger van der Weyden, uh, about 1464, and a picture of a long sleeved chemise from about 1730, but they were much the same even earlier on, just a simple linen T-shaped garment. <coughs> During the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th centuries, both sexes wore flowing robes, but began to use lacing to define the body. By the 14th century, skill in cutting and making up pattern pieces was developed by the medieval craft guilds. The simple T-shaped undergarments, known as shifts or chemises, worn from this time right to the 20th century, were made from soft, absorbent linen and provided a protective layer between the skin and the outer garment and looked much like the chemise from the 1730s. The male shirt and the female chemise came out of hiding as underwear with a new awareness of what lay beneath the, the, the um, status and class defining silks, brocades and velvets, often shown through slashings. If you look at any actors from Shakespeare or depictions of Shakespearean actors, you'll often see that their outer sleeves have been slashed and you can see what's underneath them. The exposed shirt, more importantly the clean shirt, became a mark of gentle folk, proclaiming their so social class, their taste, and their income. By the mid-15th century, the fashion was to sheet the body, narrow the waist, and lengthen the silhouette by adding a train. The henan, the tall pointed hats that you see here, and peaked shoes stretched the medieval lines to the limit, shown here by an unknown French artist in the 1400s. Fashion as we know it was born as the Middle Ages ended and the Renaissance began. Then coming from Italy and Spain with their rich silk industries and new weaving techniques spreading northwards. A silhouette began to emerge with a wide square neckline and a funnel shaped bodice influenced by the Renaissance style. Their exquisite brocades, damasks and velvets required firmer foundations. Fashion has always spread from the top, usually by royalty and the wet, very wealthy, before it takes hold and becomes a fashion for the masses, eventually even street fashion. Italy is credited with inventing the busk, the first artificial support to the bodice, and Spain the farthingale, the first artificial support to the skirt. Catherine of Aragon was said to have brought these fashions <coughs> with her to England when she married Henry VIII. These are three British busks, carved wood from 1796, another one carved in wood from 1775, and a carved whalebone on the right from 1821. The, What's the real size? The real size? Yeah. Oh. Well, it would be from sort of the top of the breastbone okay. down to probably your, the belly button okay. at that point. The busk is said to be a love token carved with a romantic message and given to a woman by her suitor. In return, she often gave him the ribbon which tied the busk in place. It was replaced only in the 19th century by a separating metal busk 
which allowed a woman to put on her corset for the first time without the help of the servant. The Renaissance from the 14th to the 17th centuries was an age of exploration and discovery and marked the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity. In no other period of the past was the beauty of the female body so exalted as during the Renaissance when the erotic was glorified all over Europe. Necklines plunged and the church railed, not against the exposure of the breast, but that the clothing was too short. The foot, or worse yet, the calf, were more erotically charged, and throughout history, other parts of a woman's body became the erotic focus as fashions changed. The centuries-old tradition of loose robes continued to be seen in European paintings and frescoes by the masters of the 15th and 16th centuries, depicting in, depicted in immense grandeur in the works of Bellini, Titian, Veronese, Raphael, and others, and persist today in ecclesiastical, legal, academic, and other formalized or ceremonial clothing. Eleanor of Toledo, the wife of Cosimo de' Medici, was considered the ideal woman of the Renaissance and is shown here by Bronzini in 1545 in an exquisite gown of costly brocade. The biggest development in fashion came with, with the reign of Queen Elizabeth I in 1558, an era of great extravagance in all areas of, of life. The Spanish farthingale was a separate framework made of cane or whalebone over which petticoats and skirts were layered. In the 1570s, the French farthingale appeared and is seen as the foundation of dress for the Elizabethan woman. The stiff underbodice copy from the man's doublet was kept rigid by the busk in the front and laced up the back, which molded funnel-shaped torso and was known as a pair of bodies. It was already being decried by physicians as an object of discomfort which also deformed the body. This paper copy of, of one of Elizabeth's dresses was worn near the end of her life and is from a painting by the workshop of Nicholas Hilliard around 1599. <coughs> this is one of the paper dresses that we made. The barrier between court circles and the fashionable world and the rest of the populace was greater than in any subsequent periods. It is safe to say, I think, that the farthingale was not worn by peasant women working on the land. <laughs> Elizabethan dress, with all its exaggerations, splendor, and rigidity, lasted for many years after the Queen's death in 1603. Fashions in neck and collar treatment flowered, and cuffs and ruffs and sleeves became extravagant, like this picture by Thomas de Kaiser. Historically, along with shirts and chemises, these were the only elements of fashion that were ever laundered. They used to spray a lot of perfumes and things like that in the court of Versailles. They, they, they all smelled to high heaven, but kept doubting themselves and hoping. They didn't, they didn't bathe much, you know. <laughs> the seductive and voluptuous style of dress, which developed in the 17th century, was a mirror of the time, like the moods of restoration comedies, which have intrigued audiences from this day to our own, from that age to our own. Extremely elegant and luxurious petticoats began to be exposed because the overskirts were being pulled back to turn the petticoat into an item of fashionable outerwear. This new style of dress, also based on the T-shaped garment, was known as a mantua. It is interesting to note that until the 17th century, all corsets and outer clothing for women were made by men while men's shirts and ladies' shifts had been made by women. <coughs> Soon this began to change, and women, now given the privilege of dressmaking, were known as mantua makers. 
with a focus on both petticoat and chemise, and with no evidence of this in the past, feminine underwear for the first time had become sexy, through the, though the actual body remained firmly controlled by corsets now being called stays. With a focus on both petticoat and chemise, and with no evidence of, sorry, these stays lengthened and emphasized the waist from about 1670. The development of women's fashion has almost always centered upon the waist, rarely entirely natural, and underpinnings have been responsible for its emphasis and shape. These are a collection of corsets in the Kyoto Museum from the uh, early and mid 18th century. During the last year of Louis XIV's reign, morals were very strict, but with, with his death in 1715, during the regency under Philippe of Orléans, the influence and the influence of the philosophers, French society was suddenly set free. No longer were there sermons on the nudity of the throat and its abuses. Free thinkers like Voltaire began to speak out. Necklines dipped and the elegant society of the salons was ruled by women. Historian Andre Bourde wrote, whether at Versailles or in the gardens of the Palais Royal, in the salons or in the dressmaker's shop, the women of that century were more than an ornament for its society. They were its motivating force. This is a Venetian court dress, and I'll just tell you a, a racy little story. Uh, my friend Martin Comer, who I have uh, been a restorer for the last 30 years, was a friend of, of Rudolf Nureyev's and designed costumes for him for the uh, Paris Opera Ballet. And uh, they were doing an 18, the, the Kyoto uh, um, Museum in, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, was doing an exhibition of uh, 18th, 18th and early 19th century dress at the uh, Fashion Museum uh, at the uh, Fashion Institute in New York. And my friend Martin had sold this beautiful Venetian court dress to Rudolf Nureyev. And Nureyev, um, as some of you may know, was quite a prankster. And so when the very staid curator of the Fashion Museum at FIT went to collect the dress to borrow it for this exhibition. She knocked at the door, and I think she, her eyes were downcast. And as the door opened, she looked and saw a pair of bare feet, and her eyes went up, and there stood Rudolf Nureyev, as naked as a jade. <laughs> Just a funny little story. <laughs> Well, he might have, but uh, not that I know. Anyway, this chart, uh, here we go. So we're going from the court dress to a charming portrait by Francois Boucher from 1756 of Madame de Pompadour on the right, which I think is the idea that most of us have of 18th century fashion. Alongside her is a lovely English woman, Eleanor Dixie, and you can see that both of these dresses were made of extremely expensive silks, but the French were always a little more flamboyant and on the, on the vanguard. And these are corsets from the 1760s or later in the 18th century. The corset and ever-present hoop provided the structure for most of the 18th century. These hoops, known as panniers, were quite literally baskets tied around a woman's waist. Many worn at court were at six feet across, often making it necessary for women to go through doors sideways. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a pannier that's been covered in striped linen. So this one isn't quite as exaggerated as the one that would have been worn under the red court dress, mm -hmm. but they literally were tied on both sides. I mean, they, they were made as undergarments, but they were all <coughs> panniers because they resembled baskets. Um, 
The extraordinary architecture in women's dress, along with the Ancien Regime, were swept away with the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette by Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, and late 18th century transitional corset. You could see where the, the waistline was going up again, and these little corselets sort of had to follow the fashion and become the understructure for what was worn on top. Fashion had necessarily become more practical, and the French nobility who had been fluttering around the court for the last century began to copy the simple clothing worn by the lower classes. They also looked across the channel where the British were living on their country estates with their love of sports, had been wearing simpler and more comfortable clothes with only infrequent visits to the court. The corset was never challenged by the aristocracy or the bourgeoisie and served as a sign of superior superiority and those who wore it were barred from even the slightest useful exertion. The corset was more than health itself. So imperative was the need to distinguish, distinguish oneself from the common people. And this is a lovely peasant dress from the, a little peasant girl from the uh, 18th century. Women of modest means wore no foundations, only a skirt and a shirt, over which they wore a corselet laced up the front, defining the waist and supporting the breasts. Even before the revolution, the influence of philosophers like Rousseau and others towards simplicity and a return to nature was felt by many, and Marie Antoinette and her court often dressed as shepherdesses on the little farm, the Petite Amour, at Versailles. <coughs> this is Mademoiselle Rosalie Dutte in a sleeveless bodice similar to the one the little peasant girl was wearing over a chemise gown. Brought to France and England by women from the West Indies, these simple cotton dresses were the forerunners of the classical Greek shifts that were worn after the revolution and what was worn underneath, if anything, also revolutionized fashion. The 19th century, called the long century, at least where fashion was concerned, really began right after the revolution in 1789. This portrait of Therese Tellin in 1795 shows her wearing the new Hellenic style and a yellow woolen shawl with a Greek design. Madame Tellin and her other directoire beauties, Josephine Bonaparte and Madame Recamier, were often thought to be immodestly dressed, but always in the best of taste. <laughs> the new fashions had said much about the values of the new French Republic and their hard-won ideals of equality and democracy. It was a period of transition not only from the monarchy to a republic, but from the restricting undergarments and stiff fabrics worn for most of the 18th century to the sheer muslin dresses worn with often just a single flesh-colored underdress until a growing sense of modesty and the idea that the body needed firm support brought back the corset once more. With Napoleon's coronation in 1805, the Empress Josephine was the undisputed leader of fashion. The empire period in France dictated a new lavishness and was overlapped with the Regency period in England and known as the vertical epoch. These are the early 19th century gowns. Tight lacing became mandatory again, and the new elongated corsets pushed up the bosom. The fullness of the skirt was gathered at the center back and worn over a small bum pad.
and that is a picture of drawers you can see underneath. The chemise that you see the sleeves and the frilly neckline of and the long skirt, it was almost like a nightgown. It was a T-shaped garment, and that's what was worn right up until 1900. By the 1830s, the waistline lowered to an almost natural level again, and skirts expanded over two or three heavily starched petticoats. The leg of mountain sleeves exploded to further point up what was rapidly becoming the fetish of the time, the waist, which was to rage for the rest of the century. The enormous sleeves of the 1830s also needed an understructure, which was provided with a downfilled, a downfilled sleeve puff which you can see on the right. And they were, they were either sewn or tied to a lady's corset underneath, and then the sleeves were draped over top. The symptoms of repression of the Victorian female were evident in the increased size of the skirt and the higher neckline. By the 1840s, the daily wear of most women included three or four, even as many as five or six petticoats. Some say even seven for the evening. The number of petticoats also depended on your social and economic standing, and certainly the working classes would have, had, would have been limited to one or two at most. These are a picture of Queen Victoria's drawers, again, a collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Beneath her petticoats, a lady wore drawers, as the Victorians call them, as much for modesty as for hygiene and practicality. There were limits as to how many petticoats a woman could wear before she, they completely weighed her down. Add to this the ever-tightening corset, and you have reason for the much-admired malady, the swoon. <laughs> the exact date of the crinoline has been disputed, but it is generally thought that Charles Frederick Worth, an Englishman working in Paris, couturier to the Empress Eugenie, first made it fashionable in 1856. The first crinolines made of whalebone were soon replaced by watch spring steel, a product of the Industrial Revolution. By 1859, the city of Sheffield was producing enough steel wire to make half a million crinolines a week. They were also manufactured all over Europe and obtained in America. At first, the crinoline was dome-shaped, but by 1862, it was flattened in the front. The best thing about the crinoline was that it needed only one lightweight ornamental petticoat worn over it and drawers underneath. Most women were content with the modest size seen here, but crinolines of outrageous size were readily available. It was difficult to get more than two or three women into one room, let alone a carriage or an audience. They also managed to keep a man at an inhibited distance. <laughs> and this is the Empress Eugenie in court by uh, Franz Winterhalter in, in 1855. In her life of Queen Victoria, Lady Elizabeth Longford confirms that the Empress Eugenie brought with her the first crinoline during a visit to England. The beautiful empress with her exquisite dresses set the fashion in both France and England. The corset of the mid-1800s still came high above the waist and throughout the crinoline era still contained the breasts. Because of her beauty and fashion sense, Many articles of clothing bore her name, and the Empress, Crinoline, the Empress Crinoline is an example, appearing in December of 1856 for general consumption. It should be noted also that the invention of the sewing machine in the late 1850s enabled mass production of most clothing and made these articles available in great numbers and at moderate prices. The American cage crinoline of 1860 had only its lower, lower half encased in flannel, the upper half being in skeleton form, thus reducing the weight to a half a pound. 
The English one on the right, made in 1868, was a slightly different shape as the evolution of fashion went on, but of a similar manufacture, also in skeleton form. This American seaside dress from 1865 in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York was obviously supported by a much larger cage. By the end of the 1860s, when all the fullness had shifted to the back and only half steels were used, the crinoline had become the crinolette. This is a delightful selection of crinolines and crinolettes that belong to my friend Martin Palmer in Switzerland. Most of the undergarments of this period were cotton or linen, were white cotton or linen, but with the advent of aniline dyes in the 1860s, many of the petticoats and crinolines were scarlet or magenta. Corsets and drawers also came in colors, especially red flannel in winter. In the late 1860s, a period of transition to the 1870s, fashion continued to be enhanced by artificial aids called tournures, or less elegantly, bustles. The French term tournure was, the use, was used to define the overall rear architecture of a lady, just as corsage was used to describe the front. By the mid-1870s, the corset became longer and even more constricting than before to accommodate the new line known as the curas bodice. And more arguments appeared, even in pamphlets, on the pros and cons of tight lacing. Exquisite dresses like this are often seen in paintings by James Tiso. I think this is a very good example. There were vast numbers and varieties of bustles made from horsehair, wire, and steel hoops. Some of these were called health bustles, which up to this time seem not to have been a prerequisite of underwear. And this is a pair of combinations. By the late 1870s, the princess dress appeared, and when I say the princess dress, Rather than having it being two pieces like a skirt and a bodice, it appeared as one with a princess line. We all know what the princess line is. And it began in the 1870s, and it was named after the beautiful and stylish Princess of Wales, Alexandra. And with it, the all-in-one princess petticoat, which I don't have a picture of, was worn under these new dresses. But another invention, called Combinations, appeared in 1877 the precursor of many other fashions of the 20th century. Their main attraction was that as chemise and drawers, they were in one piece, they were less bulky, and the corset, of course, would be worn over it. By 1878, suspenders were being worn. At the beginning, they were on a separate belt worn over the corset, but by 1901, they were attached to the bottom of the corset, holding up the stockings, and at the same time, keeping the corset down. At the beginning of the 1880s, the bustle, in its most exaggerated form, returned. It was often projected so far back that it was said that a tea tray could be placed <laughs> And magazines like Punch parodied these fashions in their, in their pages. Lily Langtree, and I don't have a picture of Lily, but she was a beautiful actress and the mistress of Edward VII. She was a leader of fashion and gave her name to the Langtree bustle, an arrangement of metal bands working on a pivot that could be raised when a lady sat down, automatically springing back when she stood up. It was one of the most extraordinary inventions in the history of fashion. <laughs> Her striking image also appeared on many postcards and in advertisements for pear soap. And I'll just show you very quickly. Ladies didn't really sit the way we sit because they had too much going on at the back. They were taught to perch and they literally sat on the edge of the seat. Oh. What began to be called lingerie, particularly the corset, was produced in brilliant colors, petticoats, 
chemises, drawers, and corset covers were all now frilled and bedecked with lace and ribbons as never before. The stuffy practicality of Victorian undergarments was being replaced by lesser quantity but by more quality. More spelt lines, lighter materials, and endless miles of beautiful trimming. You could see that on the beginning on the Tissot dress, that yellow dress with the pleats and frills. And By the mid-1880s, the undergarments as matter for erotic interest were no longer taboo, at least in some levels of society. The sudden and final death of the bustle in 1890, just at the moment when it was becoming ridiculous, must have been a great relief. The uncomfortable extremes of fashion are often followed by relatively comfortable clothing, but not in this case. The S-Bend figure of 1900 was manipulated entirely by the corset, which now started just below the breast, and the straight front fronted busk pushed the stomach back. It was boned and elasticized to minimize the waist and tightly compress the hips and the upper half of the thighs with elastic garters giving it, even, giving it even more tension. There was a small bum pad to give projection in the rear. The swan-like curves of this remarkably uncomfortable garment created figures of great femininity, dignity, and discomfort. <laughs> Walking was not advised and backache was epidemic. The S-shape, the ideal figure at the turn of the 20th century, reflected the style in the art of the time, from the soft coiffure down the long curve of the body ending in a train, became the living embodiment of the Art Nouveau style. And moving right along to Dr. Yeager's knitted corset of the 1890s, Numerous clothing reform groups of the last quarter of the 19th century, from the German Dr. Jaeger with his woolen undergarments in the 1880s, to other groups promoting sane and health dress, usually battling the corset, insisted on simplicity and philosophic rationale, provided a way for a new century of fashion. This is the English Health, calling it the health course. It's actually a, yeah, a sport course at which, if you can read it, it says cycling, tennis, and golfing concert. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went to uh, uh, the Leicester uh, County Museum, which uh, Leicester was a great corset making town. And I examined some of the corsets there, and they actually had blood on them from women, you know, doing various sports, and they, they just dug right into them. 1900 still saw a woman enslaved by the corset in her belle époque fashions, underpinned by exquisitely trimmed foundation of garments, but athletics brought about many changes from the failed bloomers of the 1850s now very much worn for cycling and other physical exercise. The free-flowing white linen and cotton skirts worn by tennis, by tennis players and the midi blouses and bloomers worn for gymnastics implied rest, less restricting underwear as well as outerwear. These little corset covers made of fine linen were worn by all and often embroidered by the women who wore them. And I believe, this is Queen, one of Queen Mary's corset covers, and I believe that she did the, the embroidery, embroidery just sort of on the right hand side of the uh, front pocket. You can see some little embroidery with, with her monogram on it. The extravagant tea gown, an ultimate expression of the frivolous aesthetic in lingerie and a delightful example of conspicuous consumption, had reached its suffocating climax of ruffle and lace that virtually defeated the outline of the body. It was worn with a minimum of underwear while receiving visitors in the afternoon. So for example, this little Rest bodice, which is almost looking looking like a brassiere, 
might have been worn under that costume. They're both in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. This is a group of early 20th century corsets. The one on the left is called a ribbon corset. The one on the right is called an airtex. Some of you may have heard of airtex. When I lived in England, my children were at school. They used to wear airtex shirts for playing sports. And you can see that it's, it's very widely woven. So it's very, very, it, it's breathable and, and helps helps to um, you know circulate the air. This is, on the left is another one of Dr. Yeager's corsets, but not a knitted one like the former one. Charles Dana Gibson depicted the American ideal of the era, the Gibson girl. They were the epitome of fashion, but they also expressed the influence of three events of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The beginning of active sports for women, the many movements of clothing reform, and the emancipation of women. This look presented an upright poise of the shoulders, a long sloping bust still encased by the corset, with a straight front line and a graceful curve over the hips, the epitome of the S-band. By now, the bust was no longer contained by the corset, so this left the way open for other bust improvers and shapers, like this cotton bust, bust bodice on the left. They were little more than camisoles or corset covers and were the forerunners of the brassiere. Early in the 19th century, French couturier Paul Poiret revolutionized both under and outerwear by designing a more natural line of dress. His real fame came when he released women from the tyranny of the corset and introduced them to the brassiere. Though he did not claim its invention, he made this one from one piece of fabric for his <coughs> wife and muse, Denise. Some of the early bras were made by folding two handkerchiefs in a triangle, overlaying them, and attaching them with shoulder straps. To achieve a secure fit, elastic ties were attached to the back corners and crossed at the back and buttoned under the cuffs. Much experiment went on with this shape, and it was the perfect bra for the 1930s fashions. This bra can still be had today, made from the latest stretchy fabric, but without the elastic ties. The Liberty Boss was introduced in 1912 as a flexible, healthy figure support, particularly for games and sports. During World War I, it was advertised as an essential garment for <coughs> war work. This very plain undergarment was not pretty, but practical and was worn by both women and children. I know that I'm showing my age by admitting that I remember wearing one of these as a child along with cozy navy blue bloomers, both made in knitted cotton with a fierce line. 1914 and World War I brought more changes. Women in war-related activities soon abandoned what was superfluous in fashion and skirts were shortened. The corset suddenly split at the waist and turned itself into a girdle. In the name of, the free, of freedom of movement for the war effort, it became for the first time not the protective body shaping cuirass of the past, but shortened to serve primarily as hip control. And though the name, the name garter belt had yet to be invented, it served that function also. The popular dance craze of the time, the tango, was produ produced the tango corset, while the brassiere now supported the bust. As the war continued, skirts were shortened and undergarments with them. Corset covers, chemises, underskirts and drawers were all discarded one by one. The human devastation that the war had caused permanently changed life for everyone, and with great relief for some, brought on the Jazz Age and the Roaring Twenties. 
And these are 1920s, again, a combination of top and bottom. The, um, the underwear of the flapper was necessarily minimal, but of great refinement, made of the lightest fabrics like crepe de chine or silk chamois. Knickers and cami knickers came into favor, beautifully trimmed, falling modestly to the mid thigh, and buttoned at the crotch. Pretty roll-on garters were worn by women who did not wear a girdle. The flapper silhouette lasted barely five years, but the whole of the 1920s seemed stuck with that name. Skirts shortened slowly, but shot up above the knee in the late 1920s. At no time in history had so much of the leg been exposed and became important as a sexual object. Along with the focus on the leg, breasts were flattened with bus binders and the waist completely disappeared. We don't exactly know why, especially when women wore less than they had at any previous time, in a costume that would have lent itself so well to displaying the breasts. This remains a paradox. Now with better hygiene, ha hygienic habits and bathing equipment, it was possible to wear even a rubberized garment next to the body. Oh, you can imagine. The chemise was now worn a flattening band over his ear and became what we know as a slip. The girdle became more commonplace and by the 1930s was known as a roll on. The stock market crash of 1929 and the economic depression coincided with the falling hemline and the long, curvaceous body line of the 1930s. Undergarments continued to trend to beautiful embroidery and lace trimmings were available in great variety. With the fashion for the fuller figure and the return of the waist, the girdle, with its two-way stretch and light control, was universally worn by all grown women for both day and evening wear. I found these in a book. I'd never seen them before, but they, they were obviously when, in, during the Second World War when the men were in, in the East in Japan. They, they have uh, kind of cute little sayings on them. <laughs> and they were called sweetheart undies. As, the first, as in the First World War, the shortages during the World War II had drastic effects on fashion in general, and particularly on underwear. Government restrictions limited the amount of fabric that could be used in the making of a garment, and resulted in ingenuity on the part of designers. Rubber was strictly rationed, and the girdle manufacturers reacted with understandable consternation. On the other hand, many new materials were used. Nylon, invented by DuPont in 1938, replaced unavailable silks, and was also used for wartime purposes, such as parachutes, and amusingly, for a pigeon bra designed for transporting pigeons from place to place. <laughs> Without foundations, there can be no fashion. And now it's Christian Dior with his 1947 collection, The New Look. It was a very nostalgic backward glance to older notions of femininity. Long, full skirts were once again supported by horsehair petticoats as they had been a century earlier. The waist was cinched, the breasts were supported by an uplift bra construction, uh, constructed as part of the bodice and even the hips were padded. The new look came from Paris and launched the fashions of the 1950s, but it took several years to trickle down to the average woman in a much more diluted form. The technological advancements developed during the war affected all aspects of manufacturing and new fibers like lycra and elastine enhanced textiles with more stretch and flexibility thus shaping a new era of underwear. With the post-war economy booming in the 1950s, teenagers, as young people were now being called, had spending power. The, para the Paris fashion of the new, fashions of the new look trickled down in the form of 
crinolines and poodle skirts, the fashions of the young, perhaps choosing their own clothes for the first time. By the 1960s, these teenagers were rebelling against the establishment on both sides of the Atlantic. For the first time, young women dressed differently than their mothers, and the contraceptive pill revolutionized attitudes towards women's sexuality. Another trend of the 1950s was the torpedo-shaped uplifting bra, <laughs> the perfect foundation for the new figure-hugging sweater, a staple in most women's wardrobes. Fredericks of Hollywood invented a new push-up bra, and Hollywood films promoted stars like Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell, beautiful sex symbols who presented the look of the day. The film The Outlaw, produced by the aeronautical engineer Howard Hughes, also designed a cantilevered bra for the full-chested Jane Russell, the female lead. This unique design was based on the principle of a suspension bridge, and its impressive dimensions which resulted in a spate of falsies and padded bras to ensure that the same voluptuous look for anyone who wanted it. In the 1960s, Mary Quant launched the miniskirt in London, which became shorter as the decade went on and necessitated the invention of tights, which we call pantyhose. The bottom and the thigh became the focus with the mini and under tight blue jeans, the new uniform of the hippie in the swinging 60s, worn with a minimum of underwear while most women over 30 still clung to stockings, suspenders, and supportive panty girls. And this is one of the 1950s, I have to admit, I had a girl like this. Um, and uh, then we have little Twiggy, who was the darling of the 1960s. And uh, just a quote that I came across by Churchill, but was paraphrased by Cecil Beaton, who was a, a photographer and a designed, if any of you have seen the film of My Fair Lady, he designed the <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good point. <laughs> The rebelliousness of the 60s matured into a new awareness of individuality in the 1970s with a social awareness for the environment and for a sympathetic natural look in the form of long petticoats and dresses by Laura Ashley. Most women discarded the girdle and turned to matching sets of bra and panties in lycra and stretch lace. The bra was briefly discarded by the more militant women's movement and as the punk movement evolved, bras were often worn as outerwear. Traditional corsetry was rejected by a generation who were diet, exercise, and health conscious, and aerobic wear often crossed over into street fashion as the fitness craze continued. In the 1980s, women's financial independence created by more job opportunities was expressed by power dressing in sleek suits by designers like Giorgio Armani. Underneath, they wore silky camisoles and lacy bras from, among others, Victoria's Secret. By the 1990s, this brash material of the 80s, materialism of the 80s had subsided with the new consciousness of ecological concerns and a facing up to the high cost to all of the luxurious Western style of life. Supermodels on the fashion runways were epitomized by waif-like creatures like Kate Moss, who required no bra. For the more modest women, or those to whom nature had been more generous, lingerie manufacturers responded with a new generation of second skin garments designed to reveal and disguise the breasts simultaneously. Avant-garde design, the avant-garde designs of Vivian Westwood featured bras and corsets as outerwear and evening wear. So this was part of her dress collection. And that bra was worn either 
over, you know, like a camisole or something like that, but it was meant to be an outer piece of clothing. And this kind of take on an earlier 18th century corset was part of an evening ensemble. And the, av uh, the avant-garde of Vivian Westwood featured bras and corsets as underwear and as outerwear and evening wear. And the corsets designed by Jean-Paul Gaultier for Madonna on her blind ambition, blonde ambition tour in the late 90s were based on underwear designs of the past. Now, over 20 years into the 20th century, women are still dependent on foundations not much changed from the 20th century, be it by diet and exercise, or by the ongoing and evolving designs of a new generation of undergarments, including Spanx. We've all tried Spanx. <laughs> Another addition in the realm of underwear and outerwear in this century are the ubiquitous leggings, worn by young and old alike on every shape and size, causing great consternation to some, like the mother written about in Margaret Wente's column in the Globe and Mail in 2019. She feared that her four young sons were being exposed to all the contours of a woman's body in, of all places, Sunday Mass. <laughs> in conclusion, I would like to quote Jennifer Frank from her book, The Ace of Fashion. In contrast to the stormy history of women's underwear, men's underwear has diversified almost unseen. It was as if by keeping men's underclothes plain and functional could secure male bodies against, as a bulwark against unrestrained sexuality. Thank you. Wondering which which came first, or was it hand in hand that the changing vogues of modesty, or the clothing that revealed more and more? Did the clothing respond to different modesty, or did the modesty? You know, I think it was a little bit of each. You know, the fashion designers, even in the in the nineteenth century pushed the envelope. And I think finally, you know, after the death of Queen Victoria, certainly it was a much, shall we say, looser society. But I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah, then you said about the corset deforming the body. What what would it do? What would a corset do? It collapsed the ribs very often. And because they you know, they wanted 18 inch waists. Yeah. That's gone with the wind. Gone with the wind, exactly. And they were all, they had, at first they were made with whale bones in them, which were a little more flexible, and then they were steel bones. And as I, when I showed that health corset, um, worn by women playing tennis or riding or golfing, um, I mean, they were still very, very compressed. And um, it, uh, it, it was really, a torturous kind of yeah. I so don't cool. You couldn't breathe, I imagine. Like that's what I say. There was a lot of swooning going on. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to to add something that I when you were mentioning about the health things. Yeah. Um, in fourth year university, we did a, a thing on uh, midwifery in the um, 1800s and how the medical industry took over, like doctors took over midwives work and one of the, the things that were explained was that women wearing these corsets and these interesting fashions tip tilted their uteruses and twisted their bodies oh. out of shape and that's when doctors began to use forcets to haul babies out oh. and, and quite often it didn't they just you know there were deaths of a lot of babies yeah, they, didn't make it. Yeah. they didn't make it yeah. wow it's a very good point 
Wow. Yes. How long would it take them to actually get dressed to go anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, by the time you got all that. You know, on. I mean, we're talking here, as I said earlier, about really the fashions of the wealthy people. So they all had servants, and you know, you had a lady's maid, and you had a dresser, and I think probably it would take at least two hours to dress a woman to go out for, you know, a morning visit or, and much more so in the evening because she would have had to have a bath and change her clothes and change her underwear and put on fancy stockings and uh, it was a, a, a lot of work. And I had a question about those, the basket. Uh, the panniers? Yeah. How did they go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Carefully. At that point in time, ladies wore no underpants. So the panniers were very collapsible. They were light and collapsible. So literally, they could just lift them up and squat and do their business. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the toilet design and everything. It might just be a hole in the floor. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or a, or a porcelain potty in a stool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You, you've introduced a whole lot of words, but I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so the next time you do a presentation and there are men in the audience, if you could kind of go slow. <laughs> Clothing, I thought it might be an interest. I talk about the going to the wash, and these are crotchless panties oh. that the ladies of the more modest look like farm workers. Yeah. So they were crotchless. So they in fact, I have a pair of those at home that I looked for this morning, but I couldn't find them. And what's the other item? Uh, the other item is a little corset. I, I guess. A corset um, cover. Now, what year would this be, do you think? Probably 1900. Really? Yeah. I would think so. Pretty. Thank you for bringing me. Yes, sir. How are shoes designed to what movie was that for? Howard Hughes? Yeah, it, was a, it, was, it was a western called The Outlaw, which is still probably shown on Turner Classic movies. Or, yeah, I think he was also dating Jane Russell. So he really had an idea of what she looked like. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. I can remember my mother getting herself into a girdle that had the steel, and she would be bleeding. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and she had to put it on every day. Yeah. Because a lady was expected to wear a girdle right. every day. <laughs> you weren't dressed unless you had a girdle. Absolutely. And she would be bleeding and bruised. Yeah. My mother wore one too. And they had lacing and all kinds of intricate. Uh, that was sort of what to say that the things women could put on themselves. Yeah. Then you could do without you could dress yourself without a service. So yes. women could then eat the That's right, they're better as it were. Yeah. Yes. Are you going to say anything about your collection? Oh well listen, um Every asked me to bring something along. And I mentioned that I had been involved in a collaboration with um, my friend Isabelle de Vaugrave, who is a Belgian artist living in Brussels. And we did this collaboration for 10 years, making paper dresses, which was one of her friends look, came and looked at them when we were making them. And he said, what are these for? Yeah. And I said, well, <laughs> not really anything. And he said, oh. <laughs> because she was always dreaming up things. Yeah. But it was a, it was a great. I I learned so much. It was a great collaboration, and uh, 
my daughter, who had gone to uh, Brussels to teach her English, um, when I told her that Isabel had asked me if I would do this thing with her, she said, Mom, are you sure? She said, you know, Bebel has an ego. The whole house dances around her. And are you sure you want to take this on? And I thought about it, and I said to her, you know what, Whitney? I can't do what Bebel does, and she can't do what I do. So for both of us, it was just a perfect collaboration. I made the patterns and the dresses, and she did the beautiful painting on them. So please feel free to, to have a look at them some of the catalogs and then I've got a very a very sort of falling apart book there but there are pictures that I've taken and the paper that we used you can see. Wow. Where is the collection now? It's in Brussels and it gets shown every now and then or she'll take parts of it to you know just <coughs> somewhere. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Why did you do paper and not materials? Because paper is her medium. Oh, that's okay. her. you know she designs wallpaper. She oh. does many many things, but she's used to working with paper. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We had paper dresses in the seventies. We did. We I, did. Had I had one that my husband brought me from New York. My beloved three times. Three times. Yeah. Picture of W. C. Fields. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going out in the evening, you might go get yourself a paper dress. Oh. And if you didn't do anything to damage it, it might last two or three times. Right. Mm -hmm. No, they were, I mean, they were, they were part of fashion. And a fad or a fashion. Yes, sir. How many dresses did you make? About 85. Wow. Yeah. And they went on the display of different they museums. Went on on tour, the first place that we took them was to a wonderful museum called uh, the Musée de l'Impression sur l'Étoffe in Mulhouse, France, which had been a fabric making and fabric printing town. Mm -hmm. And they had a beautiful museum there, and they invited us to come. That's where we had our first exhibition. Then we went to Boston and New York and London, and Toronto, and Paris, and Istanbul, and Sao Paulo, and Antwerp. Um, were they, were they full size? Yes. Yeah. Full size? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Yes, sir. What, what time frame were you addressing? They were from, uh, I'm going to say, the 16th century to the last one we did, which didn't become part of our collection, but we were asked to make Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress, which was from the 1950s, um, in paper for an exhibition at the Field Museum in Chicago. And then it went, we, we sort of gifted it to the Kennedy Center in Boston, the Kennedy Library, I should say. And how many sheets of paper? <laughs> well, Jackie Kennedy's dress took about 30 sheets of, of paper, and we worked with, um, it may even have been Canadian paper, I was never able to establish that, but they were papers made for pattern cutting that they used in, in, in Belgium and probably, you know, all over Europe, and it was just, you, you, can, you can touch some of the paper and, and you'll see what it's like. But there were sheets that were one meter by a meter and a half. So they, they were almost like working with a piece of fabric. And sometimes she painted sheets and sheets of, you know, which would be like rolls of fabric forming, and other times, in, in certain periods, um, pieces of a garment would be would would be woven. What they called a disposition, which was like around the bottom of a jacket, let's say, or a, all the way around the skirt, which was cut in panels. So each piece had to be woven with this design going all around them. So. 
Isabel would, would paint them. I would make the pattern pieces first, and then she would paint them. Then how did you put the pieces together? It's With so bookbinders glue. <laughs> <laughs> Which took the longer, the painting or the dressmaking? You know, I'm going to say, Babel was born with a paintbrush in her hand, and she just literally, she could paint, and still does, any proportion, any, you know, you, her imagination just ran wild, and whatever, whatever she thought came out on her paintbrush. So she did it fairly quickly. And sometimes it took me a little longer to make the patterns and actually put the dresses together. When you, were, oops, sorry. when you were working for Stratford, how authentic did you have to be in the costumes? Well, I didn't work for Stratford. I worked for the Shaw Festival oh, Shaw. in Niagara on the Lake. Very, completely authentic. I mean, you know, we could, we could use a little theatrical license, but the shape had to be there. The understructure had to be there. We had to make the bustles and the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow.